Absolutely gorgeous. Welcome to Murfreesboro United Methodist Church. It's good to be with you all, uh, both online and in person. I'm Pastor Danny, and uh, if, if in person, everyone that's here, if you're excited to praise Jesus this morning, let's at least let's nod vociferously here. Let's yes, we're a Dax, you too, right? We're excited. Yes, we're going to praise Jesus. That's right. And everyone online, uh, take to the comments section. Go ahead and say yes. Say yes. We're excited to praise Jesus. Uh, well, 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 we'll trust that some of you are, are doing that very thing right now. We'll check later and see if you did. But I'm excited to be with you. We're going to praise the Lord together. Just a couple of announcements before we continue in worship. First, I do want to make sure everyone knows, just for complete and total clarity, uh, we, our conference has been working with the state and everything, and we've made it. We want to make sure that we all understand the governor's new rollback. And uh, please understand that the new restrictions do not affect Sunday morning worship. Our regular Sunday morning worship is still allowed to be at 25% of the maximum capacity. So we're still able to do our, our phase four worship routine like we have been. And I want to make sure you all know that we still have plenty of room at both our 9 o'clock and our 1030 services. They're both identical. We're not uh, differentiating by traditional and praise at this time. We want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to come and worship and to be with us this morning. Good morning, good morning, welcome guys. So, let's continue and worship together. A couple of other announcements though. Our trunk or treat is on. Uh, we have, I know some of you are, are already signed up to be here with a trunk and that's wonderful. We need lots of help though. If there's anyone else that's willing to donate some bags of candy, that would be a huge help. Uh, if there's anyone that's willing to, to, to host a trunk, either here or at Agape House, we can use another trunk or two at both locations. Please, please contact Karen and let her know if you're able to help in any way. Uh, donating candy, though, too, that is a big one. Uh, the other announcement is next Sunday is All Saints Day. And I just want to give you all one more, more, one more reminder. Uh, so that if you have not yet been able to get any names in that you would like uh, read and remembered and have loved ones to celebrate next Sunday, I'll give you one more chance to make sure you have time to get that in. Melba, our wonderful administrative assistant, has been keeping a list going, though, all year. She has a very comprehensive list, but if you have any names you want to make sure are there, please don't hesitate to call or email the office this week. And if you're able to be with us in person, uh, so you can stand uh, for the memory of the persons that you would like to stand for next week, that'll be next Sunday. We're also going to have some special time of dedication. Uh, in that service for uh, some new hymnals that we've just gotten and also for some new equipment 
uh, that we used uh, some of the, the memorials uh, from Reverend Renshaw and his wife last year. Some of that memorial money has been used to purchase some equipment that we're going to use for, our, for to increase the safety in our children's area and have a good sign in and check out once we get Sunday school back going and our children's programming indoor. We'll be dedicating that equipment as well. Would you join me? And if you're here in person, but even online, would you stand together and let us continue in worship with the call to worship? The call to worship comes to us from Psalm chapter 95. Let's worship the Lord together. Come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Praise the Lord. The song we're going to worship with this morning to begin, we've chosen this song today because as we finish this journey in Acts, one of the things Paul is going to remind us of is the importance of of unity, the importance of being one and standing together, lifting up one voice to the Lord, one song. That's what this song is about. It also has some beautiful imagery. I pray you listen to this as we sing. The idea of up from the ashes, His love has brought us out of the darkness and into the light. Lord, continue to do that. Continue to lift our country, our church, our families out of the ashes and move us into your light, Lord Jesus, we pray. Let's worship the Lord together. Up from the ashes your love has brought us out of the darkness and into the light lifting our sorrows bearing our burdens Healing our hearts To a God we lift up one voice To a God we lift up one song To a God we lift up one voice Singing hallelujah To a God we lift up one voice To a God we lift up one song To a God we lift up one voice Singing Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Things have been broken, eyes have been opened, and I need a Bible. Yeah. 
Today comes from Philippians 2, 2 through 5 from the NIV. Then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time, those of you out in the audience, if you would, greet one another. Smiles on the mask, wave. And for those of you viewing on Facebook, this is time to post your comments and then section. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's continue worshiping. Praise my Lord, I'm gonna praise Him. The rocks gonna cry out. 
have actually been in the hospital uh, this past week or and are, some of them are currently home now. We have Dan Jarrett, Doug Murray, Barb Zimmerman, Olive Bell Ridley, and Donald Hornacek. Also I want to note that Dolores McNiff is having extensive foot surgery on October 28th. And uh, the family of Sarah Dorr uh, were requesting prayers for them as Sarah passed away this past week, and Sarah is the grandmother of Brooke Guthman. Richard Tierney has a request. He says to please continue to keep Susan and Perry Patterson in your prayers as Perry begins phase one of his cancer treatment, which includes radiation on his back. Please pray for wisdom for the doctors and strength for both Perry and Susan. And finally, we're asking prayer, uh, prayers for Rosie and Gary Reese as they are traveling today to Mayo Clinic. Please keep all these requests in your heart and mind, and all those on a regular prayer request as well. Thank you. Thank you, so. And let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, in this moment, in this beautiful place, in our homes as we watch online, wherever we're at right now, Lord God, we thank you for the beautiful reminder that we just received. We don't have time to die. We don't have time for the sins that lead to death. We don't have time to be angry, Lord. We don't have time to be discouraged. We don't have time to talk poorly about our neighbors. We don't have time to gossip. We don't have time. We just don't have time for those things because we are so busy praising you. Lord God, forgive me when that's not the case. Forgive me when I have more time to sin and to do things I shouldn't be doing, to think things I shouldn't be thinking, to have emotions I shouldn't be having, to wallow in discouragement and despair. Lord, forgive me 
when I take more time doing those things than I do praising you. Lord, and forgive my friends here this morning. Lord God, we want our time, we want our minds, we want our hearts, we want all of our existence here in this world, on this journey. We want our time occupied with praising you, Lord Jesus, whether we're going to school or whether we're going to work or whether we're serving your kingdom or whether we're healing the sick or feeding the poor or proclaiming your gospel, Lord, whatever we do, we want to do it in your name and praising you all the way, glorifying you. May your name be ever on your lip, our lips, as the song says, and as your word says. May your praise be ever on our lips, Lord Jesus. Heal your church of our sin and our sickness and our ways that lead to death. And fill us instead with your Holy Spirit. Fill us overflowing with praise so that we ain't got time for anything else. Lord God, we know that you're the healer. You're the great physician. And we lift up each of our brothers and sisters who are going through treatments, each of our brothers and sisters who are preparing for procedures or recovering from procedures, Lord all those who are battling illness of every kind, including the virus, Lord. We lift them all up to you. We place them in your loving hands. And we ask you, healer, great physician, great God, we ask you to watch over and bless each person. Unite us. Even as we have one voice, when we cry out to you in praise, Lord, may we also, with one voice, cry out for healing and for help. Not only for bodies, but also for minds and hearts. Where there's discouragement and despair and loneliness. Lord, bring your encouragement. Bring your grace. And may we be agents of your love and grace. Everywhere that you call us to be. And now friends, let us join together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, we finally made it. We're here. <laughs> Where are we? You may know. We have finally reached the end of our series in Acts. Okay, this is, I don't know, that can be exciting for some of you. But some of you, some of us may miss it. I don't know, but I've had a good time. I've had a good time with you all in the book of Acts. But this morning, we are finishing our journey with the church through Acts. We are in the final chapter of Acts. This is Acts chapter 28. And we'll be reading the last few verses of the whole book and concluding our time together. It's been an amazing journey. I've learned a lot. I pray that you've learned a lot and been encouraged by what you've heard, encouraged by the witness and the testimony of the Apostle Peter and then the Apostle Paul and their testimony, their witness as they spread the gospel from town to town, city to city. Pray that you've learned a lot and that God's spoken to you. I know he's spoken to me. Here are some parting thoughts from Acts this morning to conclude this series. Some parting thoughts on being the church. And when we say being the church, we're talking about the same church when we recite the Apostles' Creed and we say the Holy Catholic Church with a, a, with a, with a, with a C. We're talking about the, the church universal, the church everywhere. Christians, people who love Jesus of every denomination. We're talking about the whole church. What does it mean being the church? What does God have for us as we conclude this series? Let's look at our text and open our hearts before the Lord this morning. Acts chapter 28, verse 23 to 31. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in large numbers to the place where he was staying. Remember, he's under house arrest. He's having to stay home, but people were able to come. 
He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves, and they began to leave after Paul made this final statement. So, we're about to read the statement he made that made them leave. Right? So, I hope you don't feel the need to get up and walk out. Here's what Paul said. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said, through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I encourage this all the time because I really do try to preach the scripture as best as I can. But this morning especially, if you're able to take notes, if you have a note app on your phone or if you can get your hands on a piece of paper or pencil, I, I really feel like these three key points that I, I think the Holy Spirit has given us to chew on this morning are important enough that I, I really would love to see you be able to write it down. Even if you have to come back later and watch on Facebook and kind of skim through some of the stuff so you can remember what the, the main points were. Here's the message on being the church. Not being Murfreesboro United Methodist Church, but being the church, the body of Christ, all people everywhere who love Jesus. Here we go. Now this morning I'm going to ask you to use your imagination just a little bit. Okay? Use your imagination. And here's what we're going to pretend. We're going to pretend that we're in for a physical. And the physician, the doctor, is in the house. Jesus Christ is in the house. Amen? Yes. He's in the house. And he's going to give us our checkup. Okay? So you don't have to imagine that Jesus is here because he is. He's here with you at home. He's here with us here in the sanctuary. Jesus is here. But we're going to imagine that he's got his, his white robe on, his white cloak on there. And we're, we're sitting up there on the table. And we just had our pressure taken. And, and we just got off the scales. And the nurse has just left the room. And we're waiting. Well, here's Jesus. Let's see what he has to say about being the church, a healthy church. First, what do we do when we disagree? What do we do when we disagree? Well, here's what the doctor would say first. We don't need to get a second opinion. When we find ourselves disagreeing, church, with each other, and not being of, of one mind, as Michelle read about, having that one mind that is in Christ, having the mindset of Christ, when we find ourselves disagreeing, first thing I believe that Jesus wants to say is, you don't need to get a second opinion. You came to the right doctor the first time. Here I am. You don't need a second opinion. Jesus would say something like, I, I am the living word of God. Your health, church, your checkup, it begins and ends with me. You don't need a second opinion. That's what Jesus, I believe, would say to us. See, his word is our standard, both for salvation and and for holy living. So we don't need to get a second opinion, but here's the challenge, folks. Listen close. You want to be a healthy church. One problem is we do have folks that tend to want to set the word of God aside and say we don't believe God's word anymore. Well, I'm going to tell you right now that anyone that wants to take God's word and just set it aside and say we don't really believe that anymore... It's impossible to be of one mind. How can we have the mind of Christ if we have set aside his word? How can we agree and have the same mind that Christ has if we set aside his word? We can't. 
But here's, here's another difficult one. Here's the other category. Sometimes, even if we agree that God's word is God's word and it's from Jesus, we often disagree about how to interpret it and how to apply it. And this is challenging as well. What do we do when we disagree about how to interpret God's word? How do we agree when one person who loves Jesus reads the Bible and comes away thinking one thing, and someone else who loves Jesus reads the Bible and comes away thinking the opposite? What do we do when we disagree? Well, first I want to say, as we saw in our text, public, ugly disagreement amongst the people that are supposed to be God's body is ugly. It's awful. It's never a good thing. It's never a good thing. When the people who are all supposed to love Jesus, the people who all claim to be his body, claim to be Christians, claim to be the church, openly call each other names and disagree. If, you, if you've opened up you know, your social media at all, you've seen it. You can't hardly watch the news without seeing it. We hear news stories about Christians disagreeing with each other, Christians at odds with each other, calling each other names, tearing each other down. It's hard. I'll tell you, a couple years ago, right on the floor in the Methodist Church of our own general conference, we saw an awful lot of ugly disagreeing going on. An awful lot of ugly mudslinging. It's never a good thing when we publicly disagree with each other. Paul says this in, this, in the text that we heard from Michelle. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having that same mind that is in Christ. See, the early church, friends, and we've seen this several times, we've seen this several times in Acts, as we've been on this journey together, the early church had multiple sharp disagreements with each other. They disagreed hotly about some very important things. But what did they do each time? How did they overcome those disagreements? They circled back around to what did Jesus say? What did Jesus tell the apostles? What was the word of God? What does the Old Testament say? What did the prophets say? They kept circling back to the physician, to Jesus, to his word. I'll tell you something else about disagreeing. Friends, I think we can all attest to this, but I believe in our, in our, in our culture today, but even within the church, I believe that we have lost the art of disagreeing civilly. Can we agree on, about that? Or maybe not completely, but it's quickly becoming a lost art. Disagreeing civilly. While still loving one another. I'll tell you, I'm just gonna, I'll tell you right now. I'm gonna, let's be really honest for a moment. I can almost guarantee you that you and I, whoever you are, we probably disagree about things. I bet if we sat and visited long enough, if we talked about theology, if we talked about politics, if we talked about ethics, if we talked about, I guarantee you, if we talk long enough, we'll find some stuff we disagree about. And there could even be some very important things that we disagree about. But I want to go on record right now as saying, if you and I disagree about important things, whether I'm your pastor or not, it doesn't matter. As Christians, I am determined to love you and be your friend anyway. I think we can disagree about things, even important things, even things that matter, and still love each other, still care for each other, still lift up one voice to Jesus in praise. I'll tell you what else I believe, though. There really is only one truth, and I'll tell you right now, I don't have a corner on that market. Jesus is the truth. His word is the truth, and my understanding of it is flawed. I'm just a human being. But I'll tell you one thing. If, as we all seek Jesus together, we will become more and more and more like-minded. Because there's only one truth. There's only one Jesus. There's only his word. There's one spirit that binds us all together. As we seek him together, we will have more and more that one mind. Because here's the key. The Bible tells us repeatedly to, have, to be one. Father, may they be one as you and I are one. Jesus prayed in the garden in John 17, right? May have one mind as in Christ, as Paul said here in this passage, but in many other passages as well. 
So many places. But the Bible never tells us to be one for oneness' sake. When the Bible tells us to be one, it doesn't mean we set truth aside. It doesn't mean we set what's important aside. It doesn't mean we have to set ourselves aside and just kind of, okay, well, we're one now. Oneness is always defined as one in Christ. One mind, to have that same mind as Christ had. We're never to be one just for the sake of being one. Oneness isn't an end in and of itself. Do you see what I'm saying? Jesus calls us to be one so that we can be like him. You see? That is why we're called to be one. And it's never about what we want. Oh, this is all so important. This is all scripture over and over again. And the text that Michelle read again, remember, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In the church, to be a healthy church, when we disagree, please, friends, listen. Hear the word of the Lord, not my word. It's not about getting our way. It's not about me worshiping my way or getting my way. It's not about you getting to do your thing your way. It's not about any of us self-imposing our agenda or our will on our brothers and sisters. That's not what it's never about, selfish ambition or vain conceit. It's about all of us sacrificing for each other in love, as the scripture says multiple times, considering each other's needs as greater than our own, and all of us becoming more and more one in Christ Jesus. Not each one of us more and more getting our own way and imposing our own will more and more on each other. And I'll just tell you, this is part of why we've made some of the decisions we have during this pandemic. That's why we're having the same worship service at 9 o'clock and 1030. We're not doing traditional and praise right now because we're all kind of giving up something. Because right now we're wanting to have a safer service at 9 o'clock for our, our, our folks that are over 65 and our folks with underlying conditions. Right? We're, want, we're, 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 we're all of us setting aside some of our preferences right now. Some of us just can't stand wearing masks. And this is driving us nuts. And we wish we didn't have to to come to church. And I, we get that, right? And some of us don't even feel like we should be having church at all. We should all be staying home and staying safe. And we get that too. What are we trying to do right now as a church? We're trying to set our own personal agendas and preferences aside. So that as many of us as possible can gather either online or in person and worship Jesus together. Even if it means having to set aside some of the things that we would prefer. The worship style we would prefer. The safety precautions we prefer to be taking. Do you see what I'm saying? What do we do when we disagree? This is the end of the first point if you're taking notes. For we don't need a second opinion. We begin and end with the word of the physician. That's the Bible. And when we disagree, we do so with patience and love. Can somebody online say amen? And even here in the room, if you want to gently say amen, I give you permission. You, can we agree, disagree in love? Can we do that, sisters and brothers? We've got to love each other. We can't let the political issues of the day and even the hot, hot topic theological issues of the day rip us apart. We just can't do it. We've got to love each other with patience. So our church checkup continues. After whipping out his stethoscope and giving us a quick listen, Jesus, the great doctor, right, the physician, he sets aside his stethoscope and gravely lets us know, you have a heart condition. Regular heart exams needed, Jesus would tell us. It's the second point. We have a heart condition, friends. Verse 27, the prophet Isaiah spoke, wrote, spoke rightly of them in their day, and the prophet Isaiah would warn us again today, as Paul warned the Jews in his hearing, and as the church has been warned by this text from Acts 28 many times throughout the years, this people's heart has become callous. This people's heart has become callous. The doctor warns us in love not to disregard his prescriptions in his word. His prescriptions are there for our benefit. His therapia, right? The, 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 the healing power that Jesus has for us, it's all in his word. It's right there. He warns us not to let our hearts become callous because it's so very easy to develop calloused hearts and we don't even notice it. I don't think you can probably hear this 
But if you were closer, you'd hear that when I tap my left hand fingers on a wooden surface or a solid surface, it clicks like fingernails. Why? Because I've been playing guitar since I was 12 years old. I have calluses on all my fingers. And what do the calluses do? In this instance, they're very useful. It keeps me from feeling the searing pain of those skinny, uh, razor sharp, especially the E string and the B string, my goodness. Those really skinny strings is digging into my fingertips when I play guitar. The calluses, what do they do? They deaden my senses through repeated use so that I no longer feel. Calloused hearts work the same way. We become calloused. Our hearts become calloused to the pain of those suffering, to the, the silent screams of the lost who are lost and don't yet even know that they're living life without Jesus Christ. Our hearts become callous to those needs. And especially we become callous to the call for personal holiness in Scripture. Holiness of heart and life. Folks don't like to hear sermons about that these days, but I'll tell you, for those of you that have been trying to join in in our West Group studies, the more we listen to the sermons of John Wesley, I'm promising you now, we're going to hear a lot more about personal holiness of heart and life. That's what the Methodist movement was born in. That's what it's all about. Holiness of heart and life. But we become callous. To our own need for holiness. We ignore the voice of God. It becomes a whisper. It becomes barely audible. And before long, we don't hear God's voice at all because our hearts become callous. They become callous to the things that God wants us to feel, to the conviction when we sin, when we do wrong, that God wants us to be aware of. We need regular heart exams. The other thing we become callous to is the truth. I'm going to tell you, you know this, there's so much information dump in our culture, in our society, social media, the news, uh, network, online, everywhere, but all the time, we hear so much stuff. And let me tell you, the truth is only one of the many voices that we're hearing. And I'll tell you right now, the truth is not generally the loudest voice we're hearing either. The truth. We become callous to the truth. And when we hear the truth, we don't recognize it for what it is. Why? Because just like my fingertips, our hearts become calloused. I want to share with you a quote. This is one of my very favorite quotes. I may have shared it with you before. I don't remember. I love this quote. If I haven't shared it with you before, you'll hear it again before the Lord moves us on somewhere else someday. But I love this quote. Who else is familiar with the play, Hamlet? Let's see hands. Okay, this, is, this quote isn't from Hamlet. But, it's from a play that's connected to Hamlet. Okay, if you watch Hamlet, there, there's this moment where these two messengers come in. Does anyone know their names? There you go. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And in the play Hamlet, they just show up for a minute, and then they leave. And later you find out they died. But that's it. That's the only role they have to play in the entire play. So, this, this wonderful, crazy guy, Tom Stoppard, wrote this entire play about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that's just about what they were up to during the whole plot of Hamlet. So, like, in their play, which is called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead, there's just one moment where you see Hamlet. That moment where they deliver the message, you see Hamlet for a second, and then they leave, and you never see Hamlet again in their play, because their play is all about them. And it's this really interesting philosophical Discussions that they have, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, as they sit there contemplating life and existence. But this quote applies to the truth so very profoundly. Hear these words. It says, all your life you live so close to the truth that it becomes a permanent blur in the corner of your eye. And when something nudges it into outline, it's like being ambushed by a grotesque. All our lives, we live so close to the church, to the truth. We have churches on every corner. We've heard how many sermons, how many messages. We've got televangelists all over the place. We've got Bibles in just about every in table drawer and every hotel room across this country. All our life, we live so close to the truth. But if we're not careful, our hearts become callous to it. And that truth, the truth of Jesus Christ, becomes a permanent blur in the corner of our eye. But one day, Lord willing, and I pray before you die, 
one day before that time, oh, something will nudge that truth into outline. And it'll be shocking for a moment, and then you can receive the truth of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, that truth that's like being ambushed by a grotesque won't be realized until that one day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, at which point it will be too late. Jesus, the great physician church, for our heart condition, for our, our hearts that so easily can become callous. I know my heart so easily becomes callous. It's so hard. The great physician prescribes a soft heart. He prescribes humility. That's his prescription. A soft heart. A humble heart that submits to his word and his will. And finally, the doctor is completing his examination. He withdraws his light from our ears and he throws away the disposable tip. That part's always kind of gross, isn't it? And then he tells us to listen up. That's the third point. Listen up. Because the doctor tells us we need to get our hearing checked. And you probably need glasses. Get your hearing checked. And you probably need glasses. Why? Because our text. Acts 28. Paul says, when he's quoting Isaiah, you'll recall. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. They hardly hear with their ears and they've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears. Understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. We, we hear so much. We spend so much time hearing. Church, I want to talk to you for a moment. If you're listening to this message this morning and you don't know Jesus, just bear with us for a moment. Because we're talking church. This is doctor-patient confidentiality, Okay. Church, we're talking for a moment. Jesus wants to talk to us. The physician's talking to us. Here's what Jesus, I think, wants to say. He's saying this to me. So let's listen. He says, I'll just direct it to myself. You fill in your own name. The physician is saying, Danny, you've heard so many sermons. You've sat through so many Sunday school classes. You've been in so many Bible studies. You've heard so much. And you've seen so much. You've seen my hand at work in your life. You've seen my healing hand in the lives of others. You've seen me work miracles. You've seen, felt, experienced my miracles in your own life. But Danny, what are you doing with it? Who are you telling about what you've heard and about what you've seen? Hear the voice of the doctor to you. You've heard so much. Who are you telling what you've heard? All that time in Sunday school and at BBS. You've seen so much in your years serving Jesus. Who are you telling about? What difference is it making? In our text, after quoting Isaiah, he's, Paul says something very, very profound. And I believe God wants us to hear these words. This is what we're going to end with. It's going to take a minute. Bear with me. But he says these three simple words. Hear these words. And let's talk about two senses I think God wants us to receive these words in. Jesus, the physician, wants us to receive these words. Paul says, they will listen. They will listen. Two important senses. Are you ready? Be ready. Because the first sense, and Paul meant this, and this is why those folks left the room after he said this. The first sense is a cautionary sense. They will listen. In other words, church, not Murfreesboro UMC only, but church, if you don't praise me, the rocks are going to cry out, glory and honor glory and honor. If you, church, if you aren't going to bear my message, I will raise up those who will. Jesus says, I love you, but I will proclaim the gospel of my kingdom with or without you personally. So the question is, who are we telling? Because they will listen. It's a caution. It's a caution. 
The Bible warns us, any branches that do not bear fruit, Jesus warns us, John 15, 2, they're going to be cut off and thrown in the fire. Those are branches on the tree, part of the body of Christ, part of God's people. These are warnings. These are cautions. They will listen. So church, that first meaning is a caution. Don't stop being in the church. Don't let the angel come and remove our church's lampstand. Let's bear the gospel. Let's get excited. Because here's the second sense, and this is the exciting one. And I believe this is important too. I believe this is in the text too. It's an encouragement. I think Paul was encouraging those who were listening to the message. Because he says, it's not just a, they will listen, cautionary. It's also an encouragement. They will listen. There are those out there, lost in the world now, who may seem beyond hope, but they will listen. This has been a theme. You've heard me say things like this in Acts during this series already. Why? Because it keeps coming up. Why? Because it's important. They will listen. When we joyfully, if we skip through our days singing praises to Jesus because we ain't got time for gossip, we ain't got time for slander, we ain't got time for anger, we ain't got time for all those things, those sins, those bad attitudes, the selfishness, the personal agendas, we ain't got time for those things. If we can live in that joy that we heard sung about, They will listen. Some will reject the message, of course. But they will listen. There are those who will. We're locked in a life or death struggle for souls, church. We can't afford not to share the good news. This message from Acts, from Jesus, the great physician. Don't be discouraged. Don't Don't grow weary in doing well. Don't grow weary in serving the Lord. Don't be discouraged. They will listen. Friends, let's share the same mind as that of Christ Jesus. That mind revealed in Scripture. Let's grow closer to that together. Let's humble ourselves and beg God for soft hearts to the truth from His Word. And Holy Spirit, keep our ears and our eyes open to You alone as we share the message with everyone who will listen. Give us grace to that end. Let us stand and worship the Lord with our closing hymn, Rescue the Perishing, number 591. Jesus is
Jesus will save. Jesus is merciful if we only ask him. I'm speaking to everyone now. If you're not sure if you're right with Jesus Christ, if you're not sure if you've been saved, you need only ask for him to forgive your sins. You need only ask. And Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Only believe. Let us pray. Uh, for all of us in this mission that we have, and let's also bless our offering to the Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, we give ourselves to you. We give our lives to you. We ask you to bless this time of giving, Lord. We ask you to bless both gift and giver alike, Lord. All that we have is yours. As we give you our tithes and offerings, whether mail-in or in the box on the door or online through the link on Facebook here, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would bless each and every gift. Use it for your kingdom's purposes. And now bless each one of us. Receive this benediction. Go forward in the love of Jesus Christ. Sharing one mind. Jesus Christ's mind revealed in scripture. So that we can play the role he's called us to play in rescuing. All those who are living without Jesus right now. And we go in his name in confidence that they will listen. With soft hearts to his voice. Amen. Thank you.